There we go. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it is uh, good to see all your beautiful, smiling faces out there tonight. You'll still be smiling at the end of the sermon. Amen? I'm just trying to check. Amen. Uh, I want to just um, <clears throat> thank uh, the restoration team for inviting me to come and share with you this week. Uh, we have a lot to cover. I have been told that these meetings usually go three uh, weeks or at, at least two. And uh, I was able to talk them into just having me do a week uh, because of my hectic schedule. But I promised that I would pack this week with everything that I have. Is that okay? So I hope you, uh, you are ready um, to get deep into the Word of God and to hear what the Lord has to say to His people uh, at this time. Before we begin, I'd like to ask you if you would just bow your heads with me as I pray here and ask the Lord for His guidance. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your love for us. We thank you for all that you do for us. We thank you, Lord, that even when we fail and when we fall, you are there to pick us up. Father, I ask now that you would speak to us. Lord, that you would open our eyes and humble our hearts. Father, as angels take their places in this room tonight, both good and evil, I pray that your angels that excel in strength would be victorious. And Father, as we prepare to war against principalities and powers tonight, may your spirit be with us is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like for you to open your Bibles to the book of Ezekiel chapter 28. Ezekiel chapter 28. Tonight's message is entitled Escape from the Black Hole. I will be sharing a portion of my testimony and I will be sharing about things that the Lord has opened my eyes to see that I pray he will open your eyes to see as well. And if you were not at the meeting this morning, I want to bring you in on the theme, the foundation that we have set uh, this morning and which will be carried through the entire meeting. This morning's message was entitled, I Know Who You Are. Can I just see a raise of hands? How many show of hands? How many of you were present this morning okay we've got a good number uh, looks like about just about half I want to condense in just a few moments what I've talked about Ezekiel 28 verse 14 the Bible says thou art the anointed cherub that covereth and I have set thee so Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created until iniquity was found in thee. This portion of scripture tells us about an angel by the name of Lucifer who was created. He was created perfect until what everyone? Iniquity was found in him. The Bible says that rebellion rose in heaven. Lucifer and one third of the angels attacked or attempted to take the throne of God. The question we asked this morning was a simple one. Why is it that God did not judge Lucifer right then and there? And we found the answer in a, a verse in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 19. So if you would turn there with me very quickly, Deuteronomy chapter 19, an incredible answer a principle that God himself laid out. I'll begin reading from verse 16. 
If a false witness rise up against any man to testify against him that which is wrong, then both the men between whom the controversy is shall stand before the Lord, before the priests and the judges, which shall be in those days. And the judges shall make diligent inquisition, and behold, if the witness be a false witness, and has testified falsely against his brother, then shall ye do unto him as he thought to have done unto his brother. So shall you put the evil away from among you. The Bible lets us know here a very important principle that whenever controversy arose between two parties, there had to be a, who was there this morning? A third party present to, be, to serve as, uh, as judges or jurors between the two parties. So the answer comes to us, why is it that God did not judge Lucifer right then and there? Because in heaven, beloved, there were only two parties. We then find back in Ezekiel 28, Ezekiel 28 and verse 17, the Bible tells us something incredible. Ezekiel 28 and verse 17 The Bible reads here, Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before who? Kings that they may behold thee. We noticed this morning that this verse or this portion of scripture, I will lay thee before kings, is a term for judgment. Just as the woman caught in adultery was brought before Jesus and laid before her or threw before her, they wanted Jesus to do what? To judge her. So God is here telling Lucifer, I'm going to lay you before kings. And you know what, everyone? Lucifer is scratching his head because he's wondering, who in the world are these kings that you're going to lay me before? Don't you realize, God, that all heaven is polarized into two sides? What didn't Lucifer know? God had a jury in mind. Man, you guys sure look excited. <laughs> Who is the jury? Who are the kings that, that, he would, that he would bring Lucifer before and lay them at their feet? Who are these kings? Revelation chapter 1 and verse 6 tells us that Christ has washed us in his own blood and made us what? Kings. How many of you are excited that you are the kings that God has created for the purpose of standing? What a call, beloved. What a call. We learned this morning that in actuality, the human race are to serve as the jurors in the greatest case this world has ever seen. What a call. What a call. And we find that it is no wonder that in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 we are told, Know ye not that ye shall what? Judge angels. And so, beloved, when God created Adam and Eve and gave them dominion, Lucifer stepped back and asked himself, are these the ones that are to do what? Judge me? And you know what he set out to do? He set out to bribe the jury. He set out to, 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 to disqualify the jury. And the way that he did that is he said, you shall be as what? Gods, knowing good and evil. The word for gods is actually translated as judges. You shall be as judges, knowing good and evil for yourself. You don't need to depend upon God to know the difference between good and evil. You can do it yourself. And you know what happened? The moment that they ate of that, that tree... They lost the ability to do what? Discern between good and evil. Beloved, the devil realizes that if he can destroy the jury, there can be no what? No judgment. And so his purpose, 
His mission is to destroy the jury. Now, let me say again, as I said this morning, the gospel, the purpose of the gospel is simple. It is to restore mankind to their place as jurors. Amen. Amen. And as I said this morning, only jurors will enter where? Heaven. Heaven. Why? Beloved, in order to be a juror, you've got to be an outstanding citizen of the country that you represent. Do we have any outstanding citizens of the country <laughs> that we represent? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> You've got to be an outstanding citizen. And number two, beloved, you have got to have proper discernment. So if you are calling good evil and evil good, God says, Man, I can't take this one in because he will mess up the judgment. So, beloved, now we begin to understand the gospel is, de is designed to reconnect us to God, but the enemy of souls is going to try to what? Disconnect us from God. The enemy of souls is out to try to prove to God that you are unworthy jurors, that you can't even discern between right and wrong. And I appreciate the the, the, uh, the title of, of the theme, Connected. Because, beloved, you and I must be what? Connected. Drawers are those who are connected to God. And I like this, Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. How is it that we as jurors overcome the devil? Revelation 12 and verse 11 tells us very clearly, they, who is they? Us, amen. <laughs> the jurors, those who have been connected with Christ, those who have given their lives fully to Christ, they overcame him by the what? Blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And I want to share with you very quickly, this is setting the foundation of what we're going to talk about. What in the world is the blood by which they overcome? How many of you would like to overcome? All right, and we must overcome by what? By the blood. Very good. The question is, what is the blood? Well, I want you to think about it. When Jesus said, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood you have no life in you was he talking about his literal flesh no which means then that neither was he in in the total sense talking about drinking his what literal blood so the question is what in the world does the flesh stand for when jesus said you must eat my flesh what did he mean what is the flesh it is the it is the word of god amen man shall not live by what bread alone but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Now I have a question for you. Is it possible to eat the flesh and yet have no life in you? How many of you say no? How many of you say yes? <laughs> How many of you are nervous to answer? <laughs> Beloved, let me tell you. Let me rephrase it. Is it possible to devour this word, to eat it so much, to memorize it, to know it back and forth, to know the doctrines of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, to be able to teach it, to be able to debate? Is it possible to do all that and yet have no life in you? Yes. Why? Because the life of the flesh is where? is in the blood according to Leviticus 17 11. the life of the flesh is in the blood so beloved we can eat the word all day long but if we don't have the blood we have no what life in us so the question then again becomes what in the world then is the blood now let me say the blood does represent the sacrifice of Christ amen he spilled his literal blood for us but beloved it goes much deeper than that you see, the Bible says the life of the flesh is in the blood. What does blood do? It sustains life. If we want to know what the blood of the lamb is, all we got to do is ask the question, how in the world did Jesus sustain his life when he was here on earth? Answer, prayer. Prayer. 
That's why in John 6 verse 63, he says, The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are what? Life. Jesus' very words, he says, when I communicate with you, that's spirit and that's life. Now I want to give you an illustration so that you can get this. How is it that Jesus lived and survived and was able to overcome the devil? Because the blood was flowing between he and his father. So imagine if Jesus is speaking, that would be like the blood doing what? Going going up to his father and his father would speak back to him and that would be like the blood what? Coming down. Now what does blood do in the body everyone? It moves in a what? In a cycle. Beloved, what we have here is that Jesus and his father had a perfect cycle of communion. How many of you see that? This is why, beloved, Jesus was able to overcome because the blood was always flowing between he and his father. Amen? Amen. It's amazing to learn that when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane praying three times, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. The words are going up. Is anything coming down? No. No answer from his father. And the Bible actually says that Jesus began to do what? Sweat great drops of blood. The communion was being what? Broken up. So now, beloved, if I were to ask you, do you have the blood of the Lamb? Oh, we sing about it and oh, we talk about it. But beloved, do you have the blood of the Lamb? You know what that means? Do you? Do you pray? Like Jesus prayed. Because if you don't pray like he prayed, you can eat this word all you want, but if you are not connected with the Father on a day-by-day, minute-by-minute basis, we're in trouble. Now, beloved, very simply put, the blood flow must always be going. That is our connection with God. Amen? Amen? That is our connection with Christ. And you know, some of us, we get down to pray and we close our eyes and we go to sleep. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You ever heard someone, you know, say something like baseball, it's in his blood? What does that mean? It means without baseball, he could possibly what? Die. Prayer. Is it in your blood? Talking to the Father. Is it in your blood? Do you have the blood of the Lamb? That's an uncomfortable question, isn't it? It's easy to sing about it, beloved, but when we begin to understand what it really is, we now have to step back and say, wait a minute. Am I really connected to Christ? Now it's interesting, we know that if the blood is flowing in the body and something, uh, 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 I'm in a perfect place for this, you just know the answer. What happens, what is it that stops the blood from flowing in the body? A what? A blood clot. What is a stroke? Blood clots of the brain. What's a heart attack? Did you know that most Adventists who die will die of a stroke or a heart attack? Oh, man, you're not kidding. <laughs> I mean, let's try it again. Did you know that most Seventh-day Adventists that die, that are lost, eternally lost, will be lost because of a stroke or a heart attack? You see, beloved, the devil has what what I like to call disconnectors. Is that okay? You know, connected dis... Are you with me? Disconnectors. And these disconnectors serve to disconnect us from Jesus. They serve to, as, as blood clots, as it were, 
to interrupt our communication with God, with the Father, so that it becomes even impossible for us to what? Pray. Now, how many of you are interested in knowing what these disconnectors are? Are you ready? Are you sure? Revelation chapter 18. Revelation chapter 18. Beloved, to have the blood of the Lamb is to have the character of the Lamb. Amen? It is to have His mind. As Jesus loved to pray, so we will love to pray. As Jesus hated sin, so we will what? Hate to sin. To have the blood is to have his character, which, and what is character made up of anyway? Two things. The character is made up of what? Thoughts and what? Feelings. Thoughts and feelings. That's what makes up the moral character. So to have the character of the lamb or the blood of the lamb is to have the character of the lamb, which is to have the thoughts and the feelings of the lamb, which is to have the mind of the, let this Mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. So what is God's goal? God wants to put the mind of Christ in you so that you can become sound jurors. Did you catch that? He wants the mind of Christ in you so that you can be a sound juror discerning between right and wrong. So if that's the case, what do you think the devil wants to do? <laughs> Disconnect. Stroke, heart attack, many strokes, many heart attacks, a bunch of them. Let me ask you something, beloved. What happens when you sit on your leg? You ever sit on your leg for a long time? What happens? The blood flow stops and you what? You fall, your, your leg falls asleep. Hmm. I wonder if there's an application somewhere. Notice with me, beloved, Revelation chapter 18 and verse 23. Revelation chapter 18 and verse 23. The Bible tells us in verse 23, speaking of Babylon, the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee, and the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee, for thy merchants were the great men of the earth, for by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. How many of you know somebody that is struggling with sorcery? You know somebody that is struggling with uh, witchcraft? All right. It's fun time. I want you to notice, beloved, that the the, the Greek word for, for sorcery here is the word pharmakia. Anybody ever heard that word before? Pharmakia, the Greek word for sorcery, pharmakia, and it is the word from which we get our English word, what? Pharmacy or pharmaceuticals. Now let me, don't stone me. I know where I am, okay? Now now let me ask you, what do you get from a pharmacy? Drugs. Now let me give you the definition of this word in the Greek. It is this, anything that medicates the mind so that it will not follow the will of God. Listen now, beloved, the the biblical definition for sorcery, not what you've seen on TV. Now, what have you seen on TV? Sorcery means you're foaming from the lips, right? And uh, you got this real crazy look in your eyes. But, But what we're reading here is that according to the Bible, not Hollywood, but the Bible, the Bible says... Anything that medicates the mind so that it will not follow the will or the law of God, or rather, anything that disconnects the mind from the mind of Christ, the Bible considers it to be what? Sorcery. So let me ask you, does marijuana medicate the mind so that it will not follow the will or the law of God? Yes. Anybody know somebody struggling with sorcery? Does alcohol medicate the mind so that it will not follow the will or the law of God? Anybody know somebody struggling with sorcery? Do you realize that the other name for alcohol is spirits? You drive by the liquor store and you will see what? Spirits sold here. 
And beloved, it's amazing. I, didn't, I never knew until my eyes were opened and I began to see, yeah, when people partake of that, they are actually inviting what? Spirits into themselves. Are you ready? Are you ready? Can television medicate the mind so that it will not follow the will or the law of God? Anybody know somebody <laughs> that uh, may be struggling with sorcery? Come on now. We're in church. Raise your hand. Honesty. Yes, beloved, it is true that as we sit there before that screen, it is very possible that sorcery can be going on if it is medicating our mind so that it will not follow the will or the law of God. Can music medicate the mind so that it will not follow the will or the law of God? Now, beloved, we're just going through Bible here, amen? Is that that, that okay? Hey, good, because I want to be safe. You know, I know that I'm safe whenever I stay in the Word of God. Amen? And hey, you can't do nothing to me while I... No, I'm just playing. So, beloved, we see here that, that according to the Bible, sorcery goes much deeper than what television has told us. Because many of us sat out there, are sitting out there saying, Oh, you know, sorcery. <laughs> you know, I'm not in some third world country. Beloved, Hollywood has lied to us when if we would open the Bible, we would see why it is that all nations, almost all who are deceived, in fact, all who are deceived, the Bible says, would be deceived by sorcery. Now, beloved, it's interesting that that if we were to sum up all these things, we would actually call this... this, uh, 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 music, television, drugs, all that, we would, we would sum it up as the entertainment industry. A blood clot. Huh? Talk about cutting off the blood flow. Beloved, let me take that word entertainment. We're going to be looking at some words today that, that it's just going to open your eyes. Let me take that word entertainment for a moment. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 13 be, that we should be careful to entertain strangers because some thereby, thereby have unwittingly entertained angels. It's interesting that if we take the word entertain, enter means what? To come in. Tain, what? To hold or to possess. That's what the word tain means. Obtain, attain, retain. What do you get? It's the word, it means to possess. And meant is simply a state of, so you put the word together, beloved, entertainment. It means to come in and to hold in a state of possession. You didn't catch it? It's interesting, beloved, that that if the Bible says we can entertain good angels, we can also entertain what? Evil angels. And let me ask you a question. Were Adam and Eve entertained? Did, Did the enemy come in, take hold of, and hold in a state of possession? Yes. Amazing. Let me show you something else interesting, beloved. Revelation chapter 12, verse 4. Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, rather. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 9. The Bible says, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Let me tell you something just really quickly. Let me diverge here for a moment. It was just mentioned that I was in the entertainment industry. Dreadlocks, hip-hop, sagging pen, everything. MTV, Rap City, all of it. And beloved, let me tell you that I did not know that God had called me to be a juror. No clue. And when I was introduced to the Word of God and I saw this and I saw my destiny in the Word of God, it was so wonderful, so beautiful to me that I gave up an $800,000 contract. 
Now, I'm glad you didn't wince because $800 is nothing compared to eternal life. Compared to Jesus Christ. You know, when I just came, I was like, man, $800,000, wait till I tell people. Beloved, $800 is dirt when it comes to the kingdom of heaven. And beloved, what's interesting is that as I was in this industry and, and I was struggling because I was introduced to the Adventist message and I began to learn all these incredible things, it was interesting, beloved, that God, knowing my struggles, began to open my eyes so that I could see these very things I'm sharing with you now. And beloved, I'm coming from that, I call it a black hole. You know what a black hole is? You know that, that place where they stay in space where no light can escape from, where the gravitational pull is so, is, is, is so dense, is so strong that nothing can escape? Beloved, that is what the entertainment industry is like and it's sucking many of our young people and they are falling and falling and, and there's no bottom. That's why you see things are continually getting worse. There is no bottom. The music you thought it was as, as bad as it could get 15 years ago, guess what? <laughs> There's no bottom. It's a black hole. It keeps going deeper and deeper. And beloved, let me tell you that many of the people, the people who God have, has called to be jurors are falling in that black hole. Captivated. Mesmerized. This verse tells us here, Revelation 12, 9, that, that the devil and his angels were cast out. Why? Isaiah 14, 12 tells us that Lucifer said, I will be what? Like the Most High. Now let me ask you a question. Is it, is it fair to assume that Lucifer wanted to be more popular than God? What do you think? Do you realize that the desire to be exalted above your fellow human being originated with who? Lucifer. When, when our group had the desire to be out there in the, uh, on stage, and when we saw people, we would walk out and we saw people lifting their hands. You know what it is when you lift your hands? What is that? It's worship. We wanted to be seen as the best group out there. We wanted to be exalted. And beloved, that is the very principle that drives the entertainment industry. Exaltation above others. And beloved, let me mention that that same principle can be present in the church. Right? The Bible says, esteem others better than yourself. And so, beloved, we understand that Lucifer was cast out. He was, uh, his angels were cast out of heaven with him because they desired to be more popular than the others. They wanted to be exalted while Jesus came and did what? Humble himself. You ever seen a humble rapper? I don't want to bop too hard, so... It's impossible, beloved. You can't be a humble rapper. The audience wants to see you uh, 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 exalt pride. In all those industries, that's what they want. And let me tell you what's really interesting, beloved, is that the Bible says in, in, in chapter 12, verse 4, speaking of the same thing, it says, And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. You know what's amazing, beloved? Lucifer and his angels were cast down to the earth. And I remember God speaking to me about this very verse when I was in the industry. And he asked me, where is it or, or, or how is it that Lucifer and his angels are now seeking to cause men on earth to do the same thing that they did in heaven? And it hit me right here in this verse because the Bible calls these angels stars. It's amazing, beloved, that today men are calling themselves stars. 
And so we've got movie stars and, and music stars and, and rap stars and all these different stars, beloved. And it's amazing that God's people are caught up with the stars. Now somebody tell me, um, what is astrology? Astrology is the worship, put my keys here, of the stars. And as good Adventists, we preach against astrology. Amen? Anybody out there believe in astrology? Huh? How many of you condemn astrology? Come on. Astrology is not... Come on. It... <laughs> is there somebody in here that I don't know about or something? <laughs> no, but we know from the Bible that astrology is, is, it, it, it is, it is... It is not of God. It is the worship of the stars. And while we preach against it, beloved, and while we say, you better be careful, don't read your horoscopes. I don't read mine. (laughs) Could it be possible that as we are preaching against astrology, astrology may be going on in the church? Could it be possible that you know how it is in astrology, they look at the stars and they decide what they're going to wear? They look at the stars and decide how they're going to act. They look at the stars and it determines their futures. Could it be possible that as God's people, many of our young people, yea, even some of our older young people, are looking at the stars and dressing according to the stars and acting like the stars and walking according to the stars? Could it be possible that astrology is going on? You want to hear something amazing? Where is the home of the stars? The city of these lost angels. I remember when God asked me that, son, where is the home of these stars? These stars that fall from earth. Where is it? Where is the city of these lost angels? And in that Hollywood is the main and major proponent of spiritualism on planet earth? It's not Hindu, I mean it's not any of these other religions beloved, it's not the new age, it is Hollywood by far. All Hollywood needs to do is put out one movie and they have infected millions of young people with spiritualism. Could it be possible that all this is just coincidence? Ah, it's just coincidence. Let me tell you a little secret about Harry Potter. Harry Potter carries a wand, a magic wand, okay? This is all fictional. I mean, of course, Harry's fictional. But he's got a magic wand in his series. And that wand, I discovered, I learned, is made out of a particular type of tree. It was called the holly berry tree. And the holly berry tree was one of nine sacred trees used by ancient druids and witches. And this holly berry tree, they, they would take this tree and use it in particular to put spells of sleep upon people. Spells of what? Sleep. So Harry's wand is made out of a type of wood called holly. Harry's wand is made out of a kind of wood called holly. And this is actually, I was amazed to learn this, beloved. But I want to ask you a question tonight. Could it be possible that Hollywood is the magic wand in the devil's hand that is putting many of God's people to sleep? Could it be possible that Hollywood is that magic wand that is causing many of God's people, instead of being up and awake and zealous and and, and having the blood 
just flowing through them is actually causing them to sleep. You see, when God came to, when, when, when Satan came to Adam and Eve in the garden, this is how he came. He did not come to them as himself because had he come as himself, they would have known that he was evil. So you know what? Satan came in the form of a serpent, and we will call that serpent a medium. And you know they've got some, you know, they've got a popular show out. I don't know if it's still out, but it's called what? Medium. Does God condemn mediums in his word? What is a medium? It is a form, it is a, a, a go-between for the spirit and humanity. That's what a medium is. Anybody in here ever visited a medium? Don't raise your hand. Now you may say no, never, but did you know that the plural for the word medium is media? You didn't know that. Could it be possible that the devil is using, using the media as a media? Let me rephrase that. The media as a media. You see, if he came as himself, most of us would say no way. But if he comes through the media, then we don't have a problem because it's just a movie. It's just a song. Huh. Now, beloved, don't be sad. You know what God is doing tonight? He is putting sense into his jurors. Amen? Amen? And we want to be sound jurors. Amen? Amen. You know what a sound a sound juror is one who could look at a case and say, ah, wait a minute. An unsound juror just said, hey, what's the matter with that? Let's not be unsound jurors. Let's be sound jurors. Amen? Amen. Let, let's have the mind of Christ so that we can look at things the way Christ would look at them and not the way we would look at them. And what do we say? Hey, I don't need Jesus to tell me that this is right or wrong. I don't think anything is wrong with it. Isn't that just what Adam and Eve did in the garden? When you want to turn the station, what else do you say? Turn the what? Yeah. You guys keep falling for it. <laughs> Does God condemn channeling in his word? Beloved, could it be possible that as you sit there turning that channel that the devil could actually be communicating his character to you? As you sit there watching, you know, uh, 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 that violent movie. As you sit there watching that movie with the curse words. As you sit there watching that, that movie with all that sex. Could it be possible that, as, that the Bible really is true when it says, By beholding, we become... Ch-? Could it be possible that channeling is going on in God's church, among God's people? Among God's jurors. And then you say, Pastor, you don't understand. This has no effect on me. And I ask you, what do you turn the channel with? You don't want to say it, do you? (laughs) You just, I will not say it. Come on, say it. Let's say, what do you turn the channel with? Say it together. The remote. You still don't get it. Remote means at a distance. Not close up, but at a distance. Remote, far away, remote control. Beloved, the devil is controlling many of us from a distance and we don't even see it. He doesn't have to get up in our face. All he needs to do is work through a medium. And now, 
that movie comes on and we begin to watch it, that commercial comes on and you know what? You see all this ex- you know, these explosions and you hear all these words like sizzling, drama, action. And as the words are going, you're, you know, it's like, like you're about to just lose control right now. And then what happens? You want to go out and see all the sizzling, drama, action, hot, you know, all those things. And then when you go to the movie, beloved, and you watch that stuff, and then you come back out, and the real world is not sizzling, hot, drama, action, you now try to reduplicate what you saw on the screen. You now try to liven liven it up a little bit. And then, here's where the devil gets real tricky, beloved. Then you come to church, no bombs going off behind me, no action, no drama, no sizzling, no hot. And you know what happens? The devil pulls out that remote control and he pushes the snooze button. Oh, this is boring. Please make sure that your sermon is under one hour. (laughs) Because the human mind cannot retain much after one hour. (laughs) But you'll sit there and watch a five-hour movie without blinking. (laughs) And remember everything word for word. Is that coincidence? It's not coincidence, beloved. It's not coincidence that as soon as you walk through the doors, you start to get sleepy. Come on, have you noticed it? You're outside, you're just crystal clear, bright, and you're just, oh, hey. you know, your eyes are shining like the sun in all its strength and glory. And as soon as you step inside the sanctuary, oh, man, what is it? Oh, I'm there. And you hear... And then as soon as you think, you, you sense that the pastor's getting ready to think about saying amen, you wake up. Oh, okay, he's about to say amen. Beloved, you think that's coincidence? We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but spiritual wickedness in high places. It's no coincidence that, that when you go down to pray, the next thing you remember is waking up. That's not a coincidence, beloved. The devil is a real is a real being. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual wickedness in high places. And then, beloved, what happens is we begin to find church boring, and so slowly we begin to leave and move further and further to the back, and then we get to the last aisle, and then we're out the door. Are you ready? Our youth are leaving. We're in a quandary. What shall we do? Hmm, hmm, hmm. I know. Let's bring in the hot. The sizzling. The action. The explosions. Come on, don't get quiet on me now, please. How many of you see it? Yeah, some of you didn't raise your hand. (laughs) Beloved, let me tell you, we face an enemy that is cunning and shrewd, and let me stand here today to tell you that I am not your enemy. I love you. I love you. How many of you realize it's your Christian duty to love me? (laughs) With all your heart. Just smile at me for a second, please. Because, you know, it's important that I'm like, I like to be liked. And if you don't like me, my feelings are going to be hurt. Hey, really. It's important to be liked and appreciated and loved, even when I say something that you don't want to hear. But, God, but, but, but let, let me tell you, listen, God is God loves us too much to leave us in the black hole. 
God loves us too much, beloved, to let us go on. He will do everything He can to warn us, and He is warning us, beloved, because He wants us to become sound jurors. Amen? Amen. Let me share with you one more thing, and then I'm going to shift gears, and I'm going to just, just, oh man, show you something that's just incredible. Colossians 1, verse 23. Colossians chapter 1, and verse 23. As you're turning there. I want to talk to you about the word emotion. The word emotion means to move. If you are moved, what is it? You were emotionally stirred. You see the, the same meaning in those words? To move, to stir, emotion. E motion. It means to move. And in, in, in Colossians 1.23, Paul writes there, Do not allow yourself to be moved away from the gospel. In other words, it's as though Paul was saying, Don't allow yourself to be emotionally moved away from the gospel. We should be emotionally connected to Christ. Amen? Amen. And so... It's interesting, beloved, when we think about being moved away from the gospel and the devil wants to come in and to move us away from the gospel, it becomes very crystal clear to me why the movies are so called. Because, beloved, it's amazing that as we sit through a movie, (laughs) it grips our emotions, e Motions, and when the bad guy dies, we're happy. When the good guy dies, we're crying. And our emotions are literally being moved all over within two hours. Could it be that the purpose, beloved, of most movies is to move us away from the gospel? So now, Superman and, 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 and X-Men are more desirable than Jesus. Soaps, ladies. Now, aren't soaps, what, what, are, what is soap for? To make you clean. <laughs> Very interesting. <laughs> Anybody ever take a shower with dirty soap? <laughs> then why watch those soaps? Because they are, they are dirtying your character. And for any men out there who are secretly watching, because I know some men secretly watch. <laughs> beloved, let's allow Jesus to, to cleanse us. Amen? Let's allow Jesus, beloved, to, to, to come in and to give us those garments that are whiter than snow. We don't need those soaps, beloved, to do it. Video games. You know what we say about video games? It's just a what? It's just a game. Do you realize that, uh, you know, gamers, they talk about what's called the fantasy realm. You ever heard that? Well, the video games is just in the fantasy realm. It's fantasy. It's fantasy. But did you know that fantasy, F-A-N-T-A-S-Y, was once spelled P-H-A-N-T-A-S-Y? Does that sound familiar to you? Phantom. Spirit. So, beloved, when you say it's just a fantasy world, beloved, you're dealing with the spirit world. And let me tell you why. Because, beloved, as you are sitting there killing... (laughs) Jesus says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So that while the devil says it doesn't count, there's an angel writing. While you're watching that movie and you're watching that adulterous scene and you're saying it's just a movie, there's an angel writing. The devil says it's just the imagination. But beloved, you will understand now that the devil knows that he who has the imagination has the man. Why did the flood come upon the world? The imaginations of men's hearts were only evil continually. 
That's why the devil is doing all this to grip the imagination. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Now, let me share this with you in closing. Go with me to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. Beloved, let me tell you. God, when he enters into your life, he wants to make you a new creation. Amen? Amen. 2 Corinthians 5.17 tells us, If any man be in Christ, he is a what? New creation. And I want to share with you very quickly how that when we look at that word new creation, that term new creation, what does it help you to think of? What does it cause you to think of? Come on. We just went to the book. Genesis, where God did what? Created the world. Now, beloved, I'm going to show you something amazing. Did you know that God wants to recreate you as jurors? Remember, we fell away from grace and God says, now I've got to recreate that man, recreate that woman into a sound what? Juror. And do you know that he does it in the same way that he created the earth? You say, Pastor, how is that? On day one, the Bible says that the earth was without what? Form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Do you realize that before Christ comes into your life, you are without form and void and in darkness? You can't discern between right and wrong? Anybody remember those days? And praise God, beloved, the Bible says that the Spirit of God moved. Anybody ever had the experience? Do you remember when Jesus Christ, when the Spirit of God began to move upon you when you were in darkness? I remember that. I was in total darkness, without form, void, empty, and the Spirit of God began to move upon me, and the first thing He said in my life was, let there be light. Beloved, and there was, uh, oh man, Uh, there was light. (laughs) There was light, beloved. There was light. But God doesn't just stop there with his new creation, beloved, because on day two, we are told that the waters were separated from the waters. <laughs> you don't get it yet. <laughs> beloved, Revelation 17 and verse 15 tells us that the waters that you saw represent what? Peoples, nations, multitudes, and tongues. Beloved, when we become new creations in Christ, God separates the waters... Beloved, he did not just say, okay, you're a new creation, stay where you are. He called me out from the waters. Amen? Amen. And beloved, God, when he calls you, he doesn't just say, hey, I made you now, I said let there be light. No, he says, I want you to come out and be separate. Beloved, that's hard for some of us. He says, come out and no longer run with the old crews that you used to run with and do the old things you used to do. Come out and be separate. And what was it that separated the waters from the waters? It was the atmosphere. It was the air. It was the air. (laughs) Beloved, the Spirit of God is what separates. Let me tell you, when the Spirit of God is in your life, People that you that used to hang out with you that want to do those things that are of the world would no longer want to hang out with you. When the, you you're not pushing them away, you are actually asking them to come with you, and they're saying, "Hey, enough! I'm going to do my own thing. You do your own thing." Beloved, that is the that is the action. That is the response when Christ begins to work in you. And then, beloved, on day three, guess what happens? The Bible says dry land appeared and fruit began to spring forth. I'll give you a couple of seconds. Yes, beloved, what happens is that we, 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 we stop uh, 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 producing that kind of fruit that led on to death and now our very works begin to change. Amen? And we begin to bear fruit unto righteousness. Amen? Amen. And beloved, it's beautiful because on day four, the Bible says that God made the sun, the moon, and the stars, the greater light and the lesser light. Beloved, when you become a new man in Christ, 
you now have a new guiding light in your life. You have the son of righteousness, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. And as the moon reflects the, the, the glory of the sun, so the word of God reflects Jesus Christ. Amen? You've got a new guide in your life and you've got the stars symbolic not only of heavenly angels but beloved also of God's people. They that shine as as the stars or they that uh, uh, turn many to righteousness shall shine as the stars forever. You got a new family. You didn't get it. You got a new family. He got the star. And beloved, I love because the Bible says you have the greater light and the lesser light. We have the Bible and beloved, I'm happy to say that we have the spirit of prophecy too. <laughs> Greater light, lesser light. Okay. You figure that somebody will explain that to you, okay? Beloved, day five. Our our process of salvation doesn't stop there. Day five, the Bible says that God created the sea creatures. What does Jesus do? What did Jesus do when he went by the seaside and saw those disciples? What did he say? Come and follow me, and I will make you what? Fishers of men. You think I'm making this stuff up. I will make you fishers of men. Beloved, when you begin to follow Christ fully, you will be so excited about what you have learned and the reality of Christ dwelling in you. You will be so happy that you are separated from the world and the things of the world that you will be compelled to go fishing. And beloved, you understand that you're going fishing because other people are trapped. That's what's motivating you, beloved. I am, listen, I know that most, not let me rephrase it, I know that some of you do not like what I have shared tonight. But beloved, I'm doing it because I'm compelled. And you know what? If I'm wrong, I love you anyway. And you love me anyway, right? You love me. Say, I want you to say, I, we love you, Pastor Meyer. Say, say, that didn't sound good. We love you, Pastor Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) Beloved, day six. Day six, you have the creation of man and you have the creation of beast. And let me tell you, when I was gung-ho and ah, because I thought that my human nature was dead forever. And then I realized that that beastly nature, (laughs) that beastly nature will always come back to try to get dominion over us. Some of you are going to go home tonight because I am going to make an appeal for you to throw out some stuff. Some of you are going to go home tonight and cry. And then, beloved, that, that beastly nature is going to come back and try to get dominion over you. But praise God, beloved, because on day six, God said to man, have what? Dominion. That is a promise, beloved. He says, I am giving you dominion over the beastly nature. And beloved, that's when we can finally come to rest in Christ. Beloved, do you want to become a new creature in Christ? I don't know. What day are you in? What day are you in? Are you still back there trying to separate from the waters? God has so much more for you. What day have you even beg- are you still in darkness? Or, you know, has days of the week even begun for you? What day are you in? Beloved, I'm gonna make an appeal. And I'm gonna ask you with all the honesty that you can muster. You know the devil is saying to some of you right now, you better hear. Just be angry. How dare he? You know, beloved, let's kick the devil out of here tonight. Amen? Amen. Beloved, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. You know what? We are all sinners. Amen? We're all wretched, miserable, naked, and blind. that's, That's it. Christ is the Holy One. Amen? And he living in us, he is the Holy One in us. But outside of that, we're all miserable, wretched, naked, and blind. 
So nobody's better than anybody else in here. But beloved, I want to make an appeal tonight. You've got some things in your home that are cutting off the circulation. When you go down to pray, you can't pray because the last movie that you saw comes up on the screen of your closed eyes. That song you're listening to is playing over and over in your head and you can't pray. You're not used to being still and silent because something's always going and now you realize this is one of the devil's blood clots that have killed a desire in me to really seek God in prayer. I pray for two minutes a day and that's it. Three minutes a day. I don't know how to pray. And I want to have the blood of Jesus. So beloved, tonight you are making the decision that you're going to go home and get those things out of your dorm room, out of your home. Yeah, I'm making it as hard as I can. You're saying, Lord, I'm going to do this tonight. I want to be a new creature. I want to. I want to be a juror, an outstanding citizen of the kingdom of heaven, sound in discerning between good and evil. And Lord, I've seen it tonight. I've seen good and evil before my eyes tonight. I can't deny it. If that's you, I'm going to ask if you would come forward. Thank you.